what's going on YouTube Eric Bauer back again with some loud music we are tuning in to Sabbat sabbatical rights shit Smokes. It's all the early shit that was uh, put out prior to their debut and it fucking rules. But I don't want to yell during the duration of this whole video, so. Hopefully that's uh, low enough so that we can have a conversation, so that we can have a back and forth, or at least so that you can understand the words that are coming out of my mouth. Uh, I'm doing another video. And uh, I know, right? It's less than a week after the last video. This is a response to a video Marty Worm posted last week regarding his the most meaningful albums for him. He specifically, he covered Heavy metal and thrash. I got a cat fucking with a tripod, so if you've seen any wobble, you can thank this monster. Say hello, George. Hello, George. <laughs> I have left the house in like four weeks. Uh, yeah, so Marty posted the, this video uh, about his most meaningful albums, uh, centering around like thrash and heavy metal. Um, and then he recently posted a follow-up to that early this morning, late last night about uh, death metal albums that had the same sort of impact. So I wanted to do a response, but I'm not gonna segment mine out into genres like that. Now I've already done a similar video to this a couple years back uh, you can go back and check it out. It's called Albums That Mold, uh, which was kind of about how I got into my journey with music and discovered basically metallic shit. But that video is primarily covering my initial interest, in what captured my initial interest in music beyond the safe shit that I'd been listening to prior. So it's mostly punk, hardcore, crust, some grind. Um, and that's really what got me going on this path. I started my musical experience uh, fucking listening to punk and hardcore and crust, then grind, some industrial peppered in there, um, a little bit of the traditional stuff. So like I'd heard Motorhead, 1916, loved it. Um, and that's probably the album that really kind of set me off uh, to go beyond the boundaries of punk rock. Um, now, tuning into Motorhead, uh, you know, an idiot uh, would not realize about the existence of this first band that I want to talk about. It sounds hugely important and impactful for me. Iron Maiden, the Killers. Now, this is an old fame cassette version. I just, I don't know, I dig the art formatting for this one. Anyway, it's not about, it's not about the addition of the album. If I'm honest, I have this, I have tape, I have it on CD, I have it on vinyl. Uh, the, the vinyl version I've got is the Japanese import um, from back in the day. Probably one of my most valued LPs. Um, at any rate, Killers. Um, a buddy of mine who is super into Motorhead, and he's probably the person responsible for getting me into Motorhead, and he's somebody I still talk to today. This was, this was like 93, 92, 93. Um, and he introduced me to Motorhead, and then uh, by proxy, uh, he was into the Diano years with Iron Maiden, specifically. Uh, he didn't fuck with the Bruce years, um, which is something that I learned to appreciate after the fact. 
This is what he introduced me to is Killers, followed by Iron Maiden, uh, the self-titled, and then Made in Japan. Um, and this is the one that really stuck. This album, it's a perfect album. There's nothing wrong with this album. And even back then, when my preferred fucking listening habits went to like Black Flag, The Circle Drinks, fucking Corrosion of Conformity, The Accused, shit like that. Uh, this got really regular, constant rotation from me in my car. Um, always had a tape copy of this on hand to rock out to. A lot of my friends didn't dig it. Um, just like they didn't dig a lot of the stuff that I kind of fell into back in high school. Uh, that we'll probably talk about some of today. Um, but this one, fucking just absolute masterpiece. Um, I don't care. I love a lot of the Bruce albums. None of them hold a candle to this one. So, kind of going along that path, I was looking for like punk friendly metal, I guess. Um, beyond just Iron Maiden, Motorhead, Black Sabbath, of course. Um, I ended up finding out about this band. This isn't the copy that I've had. this isn't the copy I bought back in high school. This is a uh, new edition released by Floger Records, Voivod, War and Pain. Uh, this is a great fucking edition. It's a double cassette with a broken J card. See, it's, I'm a disaster. I said a broken J card. I meant a broken case. Anyway, this version is awesome. It's got warm pain, and then it has uh, the live demo, uh, Morgoth Invasion, a bunch of other bonus shit on here. Uh, but the, the whole purpose of this is to have a really fucking killer version of War and Pain, which is not at this point my favorite Voivod album, but this is the album that got me to pay attention to Voivod. This shit is fucking awesome. It's sloppy, it's raw, it's really angular. Uh, it doesn't sound like Motorhead, which is kind of what I was expecting, but at the same time, it does sound a little bit like Motorhead. It sounds a little bit like Hellhammer, which is another band that I kind of fell into around the same time. Hellhammer didn't have quite the same impact as Voivod. Uh, especially with this album. Uh, the follow-up, Roar, love that fucking record. Killing Technology is another one. Uh, all three of those, I played a lot. Um, didn't get super into Dimension Hatros or Nothing Face until later on down the line. Um, and I love those albums too. I even love Angel Rat and fucking, um, I can't think of the album that followed Angel Rat. But I have it. It's got 3D glasses uh, that you can look at the album cover in. Uh, the Outer Limits, maybe? Draw the blank. Anyway, this album rules. It had a really big impact. Um, because of this album, I dug a little bit deeper and uh, I kind of came across a band called Slayer. At the time, this was the most recent thing that Slayer had released. So pre-Divine Intervention, um, which I want to say was like 94 or 95. Um, but this album came out in uh, 89? 89 or 90, I think. And shit fucking blew me away. Um, it holds up really well. In fact, I think it holds up better than South of Heaven. I like it better than South of Heaven, which, you know, I enjoy South of Heaven, but this album is just a whole other monster. Um, love the artwork. I had the tape version, which was a little bit different in layout. You know, you got your, your band photo with Slayer right there. Um, and yeah, it just fucking floored me, man. War Ensemble. Spirit in Black, Spendable Youth, Hallowed Point, Born of Fire, the fucking title track, Seasons of the Abyss. Um, I heard this and I understood where Neurosis got a lot of their influences for uh, The Word is Law and Souls at Zero. 
uh, when I heard Seasons in the Abyss, the track. Um, some similarities there. Sovereign Rules. I still love it to this day, and it's more or less what got me going with Slayer. From this, I picked up South of Heaven, and I picked up Hello Waits, and I picked up Rain of Blood, Show of Mercy, Haunting the Chapel, Live and Dead, all that early shit. I fucking still uh, actually appreciate Divine Intervention to a certain degree. I saw them live on that tour with uh, fucking Machine Head and Biohazard. Uh, Biohazard was pretty cool. I was a fan of them at the time. Machine Head, I thought were lame. Uh, but there was a cool encore where they played a cover of the band that I'm going to talk about next. Um, and Machine Head members came out and they all jammed. It was huge. It sounded awesome. We're talking about the track Witching Hour by Venom. Welcome to Hell. A lot of people will say they reach for black metal when they reach for Venom. This is the first Venom that I picked up. I picked up black metal shortly after that. At the time that I picked both of these up, I wasn't really aware of black metal to much uh, degree, other than that it was the title of the second Venom album, or first Venom, I don't, honestly, I'm pretty sure it was the second album. <laughs> I could be totally wrong. Uh, my dates get all fucked up. What happens when you get to be my age at any rate this album uh initially struck me as just like basically a motorhead clone uh but with hilariously satanic lyrics and that's that's more or less what this is that's more or less all this is venom didn't really aspire to be much more than just a fucking kick-ass super fast hard rock heavy metal band uh until at war with satan when they put out the epic track, title track at War With Satan, uh, is when they started kind of experimenting with their own musical chops. This album though, amazing. Uh, every song on here I love, but especially fucking Witching Hour, Live Like an Angel, Angel Dust, Bursting Out, one of the most underappreciated Venom songs, for real, Bursting Out, fucking amazing track. Uh, and the single for that, from the Die Hard, on the B-side rules. This album, stellar to this day. And I I don't know where I would have been musically without this album because because of this and its influence on me, I went to find something a little bit more cult, a little bit more obscure. Merciful Fate, Don't Break the Oath. This was first for me. Uh, I heard this way before I heard Melissa. In fact, I didn't bother to listen to Melissa for like a year or two after Don't Break the Oath because I loved this album so much. I just didn't think there was any way an album called Melissa could hold a candle to something so evil as Don't Break the Oath. Now, I was wrong, of course. Melissa's amazing. Uh, but this album, for me, is the ultimate merciful fate gathering. It's, I love this album so much. This tape, this is an OG uh, fucking combat press. You know, there's nothing on the, on the J card. And I happen to like King's lyrics quite a bit. Uh, and I'm such a fucking nerd for this record that, uh, you know, I was like, well, you know what would be cool? Be a lyric sheet. So that's what I did. Printed up a lyric sheet. Look at that. Is the back yeah fucking nerd certified I love this record I, like I said I love Melissa too but for me this is this is where it started this is where my love for King Diamond fucking really took off I'm happy to say that I've been able to catch Merciful Fate live um, and probably one of the more uh, entertaining shows I've been to um, and I've been to a lot of shows so where to go from there? Uh, let's see. Here we go. Celtic Frost. Morbid Tales. Emperor's Return. Um, this is a noise edition. I've got a few editions of this album. These albums, too, technically. Uh, I like this one, though, because it's got that weird cover. I don't know what that's about. 
but I love the stuff on here. Um, this was something that kind of I came across at exactly the right time. Um, you know, and it wasn't, I don't want to say it was a lot different from what I'd already heard with like Voivod or Motorhead or Venom. Um, but there was a touch of like the avant-garde to some of this stuff that, that those releases kind of lacked. Um, and they would get a little bit even more experimental with uh, 2 Megatherion, which is another fucking all-time favorite. But this is what I heard first before 2 Megatherion, both of these. Um, and to this day, huge, huge favorites. Uh, if I could only pick like, say 50 albums from my collection to take with me for the rest of my life, this would be among them and it would be high up among them. Just incredible stuff right here. And then sometime, some other time in high school, um, I came across another album. Now, I used to go to uh, Tower Records on an almost daily basis um, because it was on the. It was a, so I took the bus to work after I got out of high school, uh, prior to driving, having my own car, um, and there was a tower at the transfer point, and I always had about a half hour, forty five minutes to kill, give or take, and so I'd go peruse. Tower Records, and um, for some reason, something there caught my eye uh, regarding this band right here, Sepultura, Arise, this album specifically, and they had everything up to this album, uh, including the album that came after it, which was Chaos AD, an album that I do like, I don't like as much as this, or anything that came before this, um, but it's, it's it's my jumping off point, everything after Chaos AD is, is kind of shit, in my opinion. Um, even the new albums don't do anything for me at all. They don't have the dynamic that the group possessed at this point. Um, uh, Max, and Igor, and Andreas, and fucking... Uh, God, I can't think of the other guy's name. <laughs> uh, wow. You're going to have to bear with me here a moment. Because this is going to bother me. Andreas, yeah, I already said Andreas, Paulo Jr. Anyway, this is another one that floored me, like that Slayer. Um, and I'd been familiar with Slayer for a while before diving into this Sepultura. And, you know, when, at that point in my life, <laughs> previously, look at a cover like this and be like, nah, that's butt rock. Fucking hesh. And this was a point in time where and, you know, now it's commonplace, but back then, metalheads didn't go to punker shows. Punks didn't go to metal shows. Uh, it's the way it was. Uh, and metalheads <laughs> were kind of looked down upon in the crowd that, that I was in. And I kind of got over that uh, with the help of, of this album and others that I discovered through this. Um, and this album still floors me, man. The whole thing is flawless. Um, Specifically, the uh, it's pretty top-heavy, uh, front-loaded, as I say, uh, with a rise and dead embryonic cells. I mean, that's just what an opening salvo. Uh, fucking killer. I love this shit. Now, similar to that, Entombed, Clandestine. Uh, talk about a front-loaded album. I love this record. Uh, I understand the gripes that people have about this versus Left Hand Path. I think this album is just as strong as Left Hand Path. It's, a, it's got a few, you know, if you were to nitpick, you could find some things wrong with it. Um, whereas Left Hand Path is more or less a perfect record. Um, one of the reasons I love this so much is because, now I did hear this and Left Hand Path at the same time, or the same day. I was introduced to him by the same person. We were talking about music, and he mentioned Entombed. I was like, I never heard of Entombed. I never heard of Entombed. I'd heard of them. I'd seen their shirts, um, and he played this one first. And just the Living Dead going into Sinner's Bleed, fucking incredible opening two tracks. Uh, and that lead in from Living, Living Dead to Sinner's Bleed is just fucking killer. Uh, Evil In, awesome. 
Stranger Eons, fucking killer. Chaos Breed, Crawl. Now, I do prefer the version of Crawl on the EP, um, which I've also got. Uh, but I play this, I reach for this more often than that, because the EP is just too short. It's too short. So, as a Krusty, uh, one of those bands that a lot of Krusties will just kind of get into because of their uh, affiliation with bands like Amoebics, which at the time they were just like essential. Um, I still swear by the early Amoebics albums, uh, even though Rob's kind of fucking flipped his wig, lost his shit. Sucks. Uh, for somebody that you respect or grew up respecting and, and looking up to and, and to a certain degree because of the music and the message that they pervade you find out that that person is actually a piece of shit uh, it's garbage at any rate this band was closely affiliated with like Mebics an axe grinder and a deviated instinct and a sacrilege I'm talking about both of them and I had had uh, In Battle There Is No Law for a while and that's a raw, crusty fucking album. I wouldn't call it a death metal album. Um, it has elements, same way that Prophecy of Doom has elements of death metal to it. Um, but it's not a death metal record. It's a crusty album. Fucking, if you gotta call it something, it's, call it the, 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 the name that Hellbastard coined, Stench Core. Um, but I decided to start looking into more of Boltor's discography, and that's when I discovered Realm of Chaos. It's a second LP. So of course it was logical that I would go from the first record to the second record. This album. I mean, if that doesn't give you a sense of what this is gonna sound like, then you know, there's not much I can tell you beyond that. Uh, of course, it's the gatefold. I'm not lucky enough to have the book still that originally came with us. Um, I love this immediately. I don't know why I waited so long to hear it. Um, I like In Battle There Is No Law. It's not my favorite. My favorite's always going to come down to Realm of Chaos for victory after that honestly even though I spent a lot of time with the fourth crusade uh, that's another contender but if I were to pick one bolt door record to take with me it would be Realm of Chaos this album opened me up to I mean beyond the entombed it's about everything else on the fucking earache roster so you've got like immediately searching out albums by Terrorizer Morbid Angel fucking Unseen Terror all of that shit, Napalm Death, you name it. This album, I owe a lot of my musical identity to. Kill it. Ah, here's one. Sodom, tapping the vein. This is the first Sodom I ever, I ever bought. Um, right after it came out, maybe 93, Came out in 92, this is a little bit late. This is the uh, Century Media, Steam Hammer, Drakkar of all labels, uh, joint release. Um, this album, I won't say it's my favorite Sodom record, it's up there. But, I mean, they look like a bunch of fucking death metal dudes, and that's because. This is basically Sodom playing some super, super savage death metal. Um, you know, after this, I checked out Agent Orange, which I also fell in love with, but it wasn't as furious or as raw as uh, Tapping the Vein. This album, I still think, is one of the most under-appreciated, under-hyped Sodom records. Uh, in their discography, which I, mean, I, I hear people talking about like um, Code Red or M16 before they mention Tapping the Vein. Now I like M16 and Code Red quite a bit. Um, they don't hold a candle to fucking Tapping the Vein. This shit is just ruthless. 
so good. I can't imagine not being able to just grab for that and listen to it at any point. Um, this is another one that uh, I kind of came across by accident. I uh, picked up at one point, let's say Death is Just the Beginning 2. Talked a little bit about this on the, in the live stream Friday. Um, and there was a track on there by Hypocrisy um, off of their album Abducted. Uh, killing, killing Floor, Killing Time. Um, and I, I fucking, I dig Abducted. That's a fucking great record. It's not the same as like the first two Hypocrisy albums, which are just like raw, almost US sounding death metal. Um, this is kind of where they went into that different direction. It's uh, the fourth dimension. I love this fucking album. It's so atmospheric, it's so heavy. Um, I bought this and Abducted, I think around the same time after scoping that Death is Just Me. Now, I may be misremembering uh, because it might have also been the copy of uh, I think it was Traces of Death that I had bought. Um, I was working at Scarecrow Video at the time and um, I had access to that kind of shit. And I know for sure that that song was uh, featured on one of those Traces of Death flicks, uh, which I at one point, of course, had in my library. Um, what, you can pay me to watch any of those now just because they're such trash. But um, yeah, hypocrisy. Got turned on to that, which got me turned on to other shit on Nuclear Blast. Uh, a lot of the death metal that Relapse was putting out, like Amorphous, uh, the Corellian Isthmus, and Tales from the Thousand Lakes, Privilege of Evil. Uh, still, I love those three albums a lot. Cataclysm is another one. It was on that Death is Just the Beginning. Um, fucking just killer. This, this album, while not repped, uh, by other of the experiences, uh, like I said, I think it's a stronger record than Abducted. Uh, for sure, more atmospheric, uh, a bit more subtle. And I like the production better. I love the production. It's super warm, almost analog sounding. It's awesome. Uh, let's see. Here's another one. I don't even remember when I first heard this. 97? Uh, came out originally. Good question. This is a reissue, not the original. Originally, if you didn't see it, because I showed it too quick, it's uh, Electric Wizard, come by Fanatics. A lot of people quote Dope Throne as being their ultimate Electric Wizard album. No, Dope Throne's great, but it's not come by Fanatics. This album, I mean, besides being my introduction. To Electric Wizard, I think 96, I want to say when this came out. Probably about 97 that I picked this up. Blind. Um, it was on a shelf at a place that we used to shop called Cellophane Square, uh, which is right up the street from the apartment I was living in, or the house I was living in. And uh, I had bought some months before that uh, Sleep's Holy Mountain. And I had gone back in and the dude that sold me the sleep said, hey man, you like that sleep, right? I was like, fuck yeah, man. Great record. I still love that record. And so he pointed me at this. He said, you're going to love this. Sure enough, I fucking love it. And I was smoking a lot of weed at the time. Still, still partake. Um, so that helps for sure when it comes to Electric Wizard. Uh, along with other substances, uh, definitely enhance the listening experience of this record. This is a crawl. This is not an easy listen. Dope Throne's a pretty easy listen. It's, it's up there with like Holy Mountain as far as its uh, ability to hook you. Whereas this is almost like, it's almost as glacial as an, an album is like uh, fucking a, a grief record. Uh, come to grief um which was before sleep really my my reference for doom was like grief and nooth grush um which aren't bad starting points to, to at all uh this is definitely a bit more on the hesh side for sure um love it 
I'm going to flip this shit real quick. Watch me stoop over like an old man trying to flip a tape. Anyway, on that Doom tip, this is another huge album as far as the impact that it had on me. Epicus Doomicus Metallicus. Essential. This is another Desert Island record. This is a Black Dragon Records version. Or Leviathan Records. In conjunction with Black Dragon, Leviathan Records uh, released like Manila Rose and Chastain. Uh, weird label. They ended up going under, and I think fucking over a lot of their artists. Um, I think David D David T. Chastain ended up taking over Leviathan. Let's say that was Black Dragon. That was the sketchy, the sketchy label. And so Leviathan ended up taking over a lot of. Uh, Black Dragon's roster. Um, at any rate, this album, I mean, if you don't know it, you should familiarize yourself with it. It's perfect. Perfect Doom record. This is what Epic Doom should sound like. Right here. This album, the first two Solitude Eternus records. That's Epic Doom, in a nutshell. If somebody's like, hey, I want to get into this style of music with some old shit, that's what I'm going to point them towards. And then I'm going to point them towards Reverend Bizarre, Lord Vicar, uh, fucking that type of shit. At any rate, I, I feel so strongly about this record, I don't have a lot of words to describe it. It's amazing, it's perfect. I'm like dragon here. Um, there's another one, Niflheim. They're self-titled. This is a Nuclear War Now reissue. I want to say now, it's, it's technically considered a boot. This album is hard as fuck to find. These guys blew up somehow. So when I first ran across Niflheim, I was at a record shop. At this point, I was living in an apartment uh, in Seattle. Uh, and I had a bunch of record stores within like four or five block walk from where I lived. <coughs> and that's at the nearest one. I found the 12 inch for this. I found Behrens Drawing Down the Moon and Arch Goat's Angel Cunt. All on the same trip. All for under 25 bucks, those three. I no longer have any of those albums, so fuck me, right? Um, this album is amazing. This is exactly kind of what I was hoping it would be when I picked it up. It's this dirty, motorhead-driven, First wave black metal sounds like Venom Enemy. At least that's what I heard at the time when I put this on. I mean, it's a little bit more like meth addled than those albums, but it's fucking shit. The so Rager is perfect. The follow up's amazing, also. I still love Nif Niflheim. They're putting out awesome shit. They just put out 7 inch, which is like everything else they put out, impossible to find again uh, uh, already. Um, here's another one. I've talked about this one on the channel before. Usurpers, fucking Diabolicis. When I, I discovered this record, same record shop as at Niflheim. Uh, I picked up the CD version. I saw that front cover. <laughs> I saw these dudes on the back and I thought, that's going to be awesome. <laughs> um, and it's funny because I saw pictures of them for, uh, promo pictures for them for Thresholds, or Threshold of the Usurper, which was the EP that came before this. And they're like wearing like white Reeboks and uh, they do not look like that. Now, you see those pictures, you might think it's going to be a black metal record. And you can hear some black metal references in here. Um, but this is just straight up Celtic Frost worship. It's, it's absolutely indebted to... Uh, to Megatherium. Um, from the vocal department to the bass to the guitar work and the drumming, this is as much of an homage as Dark Throne's Panzerfaust 
I like this better than Panzerfaust. And I was gonna go into this video saying that without having listened to it for probably the last six months. I put it on prior to recording, and yeah, I still think it's better than Panzerfaust. So, fucking fight me. Here's another one. This shit, Essential. Here's another album that I talked about a little bit on our um, live stream. Creator, uh, it's Pleasure to Kill. This one is, it's not called Pleasure to Kill. Pleasure to Kill came out in 1986, released by Noise Records. So 1987, for whatever reason, Noise decided to reissue Pleasure to Kill with a bonus track called After the Attack. And uh, that's what this is, After the Attack. It's literally Pleasure to Kill with one additional track. Um, I don't even want to tell you how many times I have this record. <laughs> on various formats, whether it's this version or various versions of Pleasure to Kill. Um, but I do think that Pleasure to Kill is probably the best the best thrash album ever recorded. Best German thrash album ever recorded, for sure. Um, and I like German thrash a lot. There's a few genres that like I get really, really involved in, deep in. That'd be like Japanese hardcore, South American metal, uh, and fucking German thrash. I fuck with German thrash, and this shit is better than anything else released out of that scene. It's my opinion. Um, yeah, it's just an amazing record. You should definitely be familiar with Pleasure to Kill. If you're not, stop watching this video. I'm already almost 40 minutes in. Stop watching me to listen to Creator. Uh, let's see. So I went to it on a trip to Vegas back in like the late 90s uh, and I came across this at a warehouse music on the Las Vegas Strip. This is the Chasm, Death Cult for Eternity, The Triumph, that's actually, yeah, that's the full title. This is a reissue, um, at the time I had the original, even these reissues go for a lot of money. I don't know that this album ever saw a vinyl release. I have a couple Chasm records on, uh, on Wax. One of the reasons I picked this up is because uh, I knew this guy right here. Uh, this is not the original Chasm lineup. Kind of went back and forth with a few members. Two of those guys ended up moving to Seattle. Uh, one of them, uh, Luis Martinez. He is a tattoo artist, works out of Olympia, Washington. Does awesome work. He also fucks around with photography. Fucking great photographer. Um, he was in this band at a few different points and this guy Eric Diaz was as well. And these guys uh, I met because I worked like I said, at a place called Scarecrow Video at the time, which was uh, is one of the biggest video stores in the country, if not the world, um, still going. So props to them. Um, at any rate, they would come in a lot. And we just started chit-chatting um, because they're regulars and I worked there and we wore some of the same t-shirts uh, and talked about music. And I got turned on the chasm and I never found any of this shit when I lived in Seattle. But when I was in Vegas, saw this, picked it up, fucking love it. This is fucking awesome death metal. It's super complex, but at the same time, it's easy to get your head around. It's not pretentious. Um, it's got Daniel Corchado, who's on one of my favorite incantation records, the Diabolical, uh, Diabolic Conquest. This record, and I'll, I'll stand behind, celebrate most, if not all, of the Chasm's discography, but this is them at probably their best. Fucking love this record. Now, talking to those guys, um, being that they did come up to Seattle from Mexico, um, knew a lot about a fucking lot of music that just wasn't accessible. Uh, outside of like Mexico. One of those bands was this. They turned me on to this shit. Uh, and this is just fucking masterful. Shove the breath. I mean, I, I want to say I've talked about this record before, but I was just playing in the background. I know I've shown um, the EP that came before this which I've got on vinyl behind me. 
Um, this is her full length, the first full length, and it fucking smokes. And a lot of people just accuse it of being morbid angel worship, which, I mean, it kind of is, to be fair. Um, but at that point in time, I mean, what was not for the most part? But it doesn't sound American. It definitely has its own identity. It has its own sound. Um, you know, very Lovecraft indebted. Uh, and it's just, I love this fucking record. I love it so much. <laughs> I love it so much. So good. You gotta get into it. It's awesome. Another essential one. And when I started listening to uh, getting, you know, in touch or in tune with a lot of these bands from like Mexico, it broadened my horizons beyond just like Sepultura and Sarcophago, which, you know, of course, if you've heard Sepultura and Sarcophago, you, know, you probably dove in into a little bit more of that Brazilian scene, whether we're talking like MX or fucking Mutilator or Chacal. Um, at any rate, this was a band that was up and coming. It's Rebellion. And at the time that this came out, Christian had two records out. And these guys are from the same area of Brazil as Christian. This album sounds a lot like Christian, but it is, for my for my money, it's a way more feral, relentless effort. Totally savage. Fucking shit just is jaw dropping. Um, absolutely indebted to like early Slayer, Show No Mercy, Hell Awaits, Haunting the Chapel. Um, but then you'll also hear like elements of say like Angel Corpse um, who were also quite popular at the time um, this stuff is just brutal it's still like I said it holds up very well um, and if you're only going to buy one Rebellion album I don't think they have many uh, this is the one to get right here I don't know how easy this is to find these days but fucking rules and I just want to say Lastly, one more because why not push it to 45 minutes? Fuck! Pudge and Stench. Club Mondo Bazaar for members only. Censored artwork on the cassette. I don't know why the US version did that. They didn't censor the CD or vinyl version, uh, Nuclear Blast, that is, but they did censor the tape version. It's weird. At any rate, I love this fucking pungent scent. A lot of people say Bing Cop Buttering or For God, Your Soul, For Me, Your Flesh. And I love both of those records too. But this is the album that I really fell in love with pungent scent by listening to. Um, I wrote, I took the bus a lot back then. Um, Seattle, it's hard to drive. Um, the bus is just easier, makes more sense. It's cheaper for sure. Uh, and this was on my bus rides with me a lot. Uh, and honestly, Kleister Boogie, fucking forget about it. I'd rewind, I'd play the song, I'd rewind to hear it again, so on and so forth. Fucking, I'm a family man. I love that fucking track. One of my favorite Pubs and Sense tracks. And this turned me on to a lot of death. Well, I got into this because um, I had forgotten about them. And I stumbled across a copy of this, bought it. I went to high school with a guy who was really into Pungent Stench. Uh, and he wore a lot of their long sleeves. And I was just visually familiar with what that looked like. And I was like, I want to check that shit out. And then I forgot about it for some years. And I was at the record store, tape store, found a used copy. Probably around 96, 95, 96, maybe 97. Uh, and yeah, I've been a Pungent Stench fan since lucky enough to see them play live and they toured for Amputee uh, back when I was living in Vegas and uh, it was a killer show. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't really appreciate a lot of my time in Las Vegas. I met some cool people who I'm still in touch with, um, but I did see some killer shows. Punch and Stench was one of those. Um, at any rate, that's it. That's all I've got. I've been fucking talking at this camera for 45 minutes now. I think it's time I stop. Enjoy the rest of my night, because I gotta go back to work in the fucking morning. Right there. Right over there. It's my kitchen table I'm pointing at.
where I've been the last four weeks. Plugging away. Be safe. Take care of yourselves, you two.